Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For we know that God works all things for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, this verse from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, really epitomizes one of the major themes in the story of Joseph, and that is the fact that God will work all things for the good uh, through Joseph and for Joseph throughout this story. The story of Joseph begins in Genesis chapter 37, and this image here depicts Joseph in his multicolored robe, or amazing technicolored dream coat, and the robe is given to him by Jacob, uh, his father, but who was also the father of all his brothers, and this signifies Joseph's favor. Um, to the right of Joseph, we have his younger brother Benjamin, and to the left, his older brothers, um, who do not look too happy. In the beginning of this story, Joseph has these two dreams that foretell the fact that he will rule over his brothers and his family. And the 11 stars and the 11 sheaves of grain are bowing uh, to Joseph in these dreams. Now, while these dreams will certainly come true, they didn't do Joseph any favors. He's all, already the favorite of Jacob, so his brothers are already jealous and envious. And now he's having these dreams that he tells them that he will rule over them. That's not, uh, that's just adding some fuel to their fire. So the brothers, in fact, plot to kill Joseph. And one day while they're out, they're discussing their plans and they decide that they're going to kill him. But Reuben, the oldest brother, tells them, you know what? We can't do this. This is our brother. It will crush our father, so let's just leave him in a pit. And Reuben, in fact, plans to come back later and bring Joseph home to their father, Jacob. However, in the meanwhile, Joseph is going to be sold into slavery. So Judah, one of the elder brothers, um, says, well, you know what? Instead of killing him, maybe Reuben's right. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Let's sell him into slavery instead. So not um, that much of a better option for Joseph, but they do in fact sell him, and then he's going to end up in Egypt. So Joseph is taken from his homeland and his family, betrayed by his brothers, but we are reminded that the Lord was with Joseph, and wherever he goes, he prospers. And his master that purchased Joseph in Egypt, Potiphar, um, notices that there's something about this Joseph, and it really is the fact that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. And this is going to uh, be a constant theme, no matter what happens to Joseph, the Lord is with him. So things are going about as well as they can for someone who's just been sold into a foreign land and into slavery. And um, Joseph is working for Potiphar, but Potiphar isn't the only person who has noticed Joseph. Potiphar's wife notices Joseph, but for all the wrong reasons. And in fact, she is going to aggressively pursue Joseph in an attempt to get him to lie with her. And he consistently refuses these um, pursuits, but yet there is this one time where they are alone and again... Potiphar's wife is pursuing Joseph and, in fact, snatches his robe from him, and he leaves and escapes the situation. However, Potiphar's wife uses uh, Joseph's robe um, against him in an effort to falsely accuse him. And Potiphar is going to be very angry about this, even though it's not true. He doesn't know that, and so Joseph is going to be thrown into prison. And while Joseph was in prison, the Lord was still with him. And in fact, the prison warden puts Joseph in charge because he, like Potiphar did prior, uh, notices something about Joseph and sees that he is a leader and puts him in charge of the other prisoners. And in that role, Joseph meets a couple of prisoners, uh, former employees of Pharaoh, 
and they offended Pharaoh in some way. So we have the chief butler or the cupbearer and the baker are both in the prison and they both have these dreams that Joseph will interpret. And the cupbearer, his dream, Joseph predicts that he will restore, he, he will be restored to his position. So he'll get his job back. And then the baker wants to know what's his fate, what's his future. And Joseph predicts that his dream is a foretelling that he will be hanged, he will be killed in three days' time by Pharaoh. Both those dreams come true. And Joseph asks the cupbearer to remember him. In other words, remember that I did you this favor. And when you see Pharaoh, put in a good word for me. Let him know my situation, that I'm innocent and that I'm here unjustly. So please remember me. But we learn that the cupbearer forgets about Joseph. And two years go by until Pharaoh himself has a few dreams that no one can interpret. And that is the moment when the cupbearer remembers Joseph and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And those dreams essentially uh, predict that there will be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine following those seven years of plenty. So Joseph tells Pharaoh those fat cows, those seven fat cows represent seven really good years of harvest. You really want to store up the food because those seven skinny cows in your dream represent seven years of famine to follow. So uh, Pharaoh is so impressed by this, he actually puts Joseph in charge of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. And he tells everyone to go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So Joseph is now in charge, second only to Pharaoh. And after the seven good years of harvest, the seven years of famine begin. And this affects not only the people in Egypt, but also the people back home. So Jacob, Joseph's father, and his brothers are also being impacted by the famine. So Jacob is going to send the other older brothers to Egypt. He does keep Benjamin behind, Joseph's younger brother, because he doesn't want anything to happen to him. So when the brothers arrive to Egypt, the, uh, the ten older brothers, they actually encounter Joseph but don't recognize him. So there's a lot of irony here. And Joseph certainly recognizes them, but it's been 20 years. Joseph is now this authority figure in Egypt, and he probably dresses and looks Egyptian. So they don't recognize him. But uh, Joseph certainly sees and knows who they are. And so he's going to put them through a series of tests. And one of the main things Joseph wants out of these tests is to see if his younger brother Benjamin is okay. So he ask them to bring their other brother, their younger brother. And again, they still don't know who Joseph is. And Joseph wants to see if they, one, um, have changed at all. But two, he's probably wondering if, there's, if <laughs> his younger brother, also son of Rachel, is still alive because they sold him into slavery. So he's probably wondering, what, what ever came of my younger brother, Benjamin? So eventually, they go back, convince Jacob to allow them to take Benjamin with them back to Egypt. And begrudgingly, Jacob eventually lets them take Benjamin. And while they're there with Benjamin, Joseph pulls a little bit of a ruse and tricks them and essentially sets up Benjamin uh, to make it look like Benjamin stole something. And so he threatens to keep Benjamin, but Judah steps up and says, listen, please send the boy back home and take me instead. Judah is willing to offer himself instead of Benjamin. And then you have this moment where Joseph just breaks down and weeps and cries and sees that the brothers have changed and he um, embraces them and reveals who he is and tells them that I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. You meant harm for me, but God planned it for the good of many. And this is just, again, that theme that God has worked through all these different situations and circumstances to bring about his uh, plan to benefit and save, really, many through Joseph. Um, this famine would have hit everyone so much harder if Joseph had not been there to 
um, foresee it uh, with God's help, and then also to oversee that that whole project. So there's a great scene of forgiveness and reconciliation here. Joseph forgives his brothers, and um, the entire family ends up coming to Egypt. Jacob and all the brothers end up coming to Egypt, and Joseph is in good standing with Pharaoh. So they do very well, and they're given a very good piece of real estate, uh, the land of Goshen, so right on the Nile Delta, very fertile land. And in fact, uh, this is where we're going to segue to the next book in the Bible and the next part of the story, uh, the Exodus. And um, just a quote here from earlier in Genesis, Genesis 15, God told Abram, who became Abraham, that his descendants were going to be strangers in a land that is not theirs, uh, Egypt, and where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. So that's where the story of Exodus is going to pick up. While Joseph and his family are doing well in Egypt, as generations go by, uh, future pharaohs will not be as kind to um, the Israelites. And that's where we'll pick up with the story of Moses and the story of the Exodus.